Welcome back to the Neurosymbolic Channel. So I'm Paulo Shakarian, and today with me is Wout Fusen, who is a, a student at KU Leuven in Belgium. And I got interested in talking to him because he recently posted a really cool video on YouTube where he uses neurosymbolic AI, uh, specifically Deep Problog, to make a self-driving car in the Grand Theft Auto video game. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I took some uh, time off from my faculty position a while back to create a machine learning startup. And that taught me a lot about the practicalities of taking technology and transitioning it uh, to use in real engineering projects. And what inspired me about what Woot did was that he tried to move um, a lot of these ideas in neural symbolic uh, AI toward a more practical use case. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to welcome him to the channel. Hello, Woot. How are you today? I'm doing pretty fine. Thank you. So uh, maybe if you could start out by kind of telling us a little bit about your background, what you're studying, and how you got interested in uh, doing projects like this. Um, I first started out like, um, I think, seven years ago, maybe. But I was first studying psychology. And while studying psychology, I got really interested in AI. So I switched to a computer science degree. Uh, just to study AI, and I'm now in my uh, master's, in which I really specify in artificial intelligence and follow a lot of courses about AI. And one of those courses was a course in which I had to select an advanced topic that's currently being researched. And I chose neurosymbolic AI because it sounded interesting to me. And basically, I developed a project with it, which was required for the course. And because I thought it was an interesting project, I decided to make a video about it. That's a, uh, and I think that turned out really quite interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that impressed me about what you did was you did this on actually fairly limited hardware. Um, yeah. And maybe if you could comment on, on kind of the platform that you used to do this project. Um, like I used a gaming PC from 2010 or something like I normally develop on, on Mac, but, uh, but because some libraries of deep problem weren't supported on Mac, I had to switch to my old gaming PC. <laughs> so I had to do it with the hardware I had, which wasn't that, uh, expensive or powerful. And so, um. You know, so in terms of uh, training, um, you you did a lot to train this model. Um, did you feel that uh, using deep problog allowed you to get away with less training and leverage your uh, your more modest hardware that you had than otherwise? Um, like I also trained like a pure neural network to for the same task so i could compare it with uh, the problem but i think the main advantage of the problem is that you can use multiple neural networks together which each pay attention to a certain aspect of a self-driving car and that it provides like an easy method to combine those so you don't need to have like one large neural network but you can have multiple smaller ones each doing a specific simple task so did you try training just a normal you know neural network end to end for this task on the same system uh yes like how, in, how did the results change um it was mainly it took a bit uh longer to train but also i compared the results of letting the car drive around a tour around the highways of the city and I was timing like how many manual interventions were necessary or and how fast the model could drive around the tour on, on the city. And we basically found that by using the problem that the car made uh, less mistakes, so less interventions were necessary. And also more, it was driving faster. So it was doing the tour in a, in a better way, I would say. 
and that was one of the main results we found. We could take a look at the video and we could maybe see um, some of the results. So hold on. Yeah. Um, I like we were really surprised when we were developing this and just letting the car drive around and we were excited to see like if a pedestrian would step on the road that the car would indeed stop and of course it isn't working perfectly but that some of the things that we specified in the logic rules were actually uh, happening so that was excited to us. So maybe let's get a little bit into the nuts and bolts of this. Um, you know, so I think kind of for the general viewer, maybe if you can talk a bit about the logic program in Deep Problog, you know, where that came from and, you know, what you think that allowed you to do. Um like uh, Deep Prolog provided us with a neural symbolic extension to Prolog. So we had like neural predicates, which we could use for low level reasoning tasks, such as uh, detection of objects or detection if the car was going to the left or right of the road, or also uh, to, uh, to, uh, to know the speed of the car. And then we also had some rules which were basic version of the traffic rules uh, provided in, in just regular uh, prologue rules. And those could then work together to uh, provide a model which both integrates these neural networks and the logic rules. So in this case, the rules were known a priori. You design that as part of your, your process. Yeah, we had to come up with some rules ourselves so that the car would drive according to those. So in training the neural network, um, you know, you said in the video that you guys spent a whole lot of time just driving around in GTA and, uh, you know, recording uh, the keystrokes and the screen. Uh, maybe can you talk a bit about kind of the mechanics in doing that, you know, the what you developed um, for that, both from a practical perspective, recording the screen and the keystrokes, and then how you fed that into the CNN and how that, you know, that lower level neural structure then interfaced with the logic program. Maybe walk us through some of that. Um, like the first thing we had to do was, of course, develop a, a Python program, which would then take screenshots and together it would label it together with the key presses we were currently pressing. So we had to drive around according to the rules we specified in our logic program, which was also one of the difficulties of the project. And that's in the problem, it isn't, or it wasn't possible for us to like independently train each neural network because normally I would, for example, to design a neural network, which can detect uh, traffic lights. I would uh, get a data set of labeled examples of traffic lights being red or green. But, but with our program or with the problem, it basically had to learn what uh, green and red was by inferring it from the rules. For example, we had a rule which could, for example, state that if, uh, if there is a red light, then the car needs to slow down and if uh, there is a green light, then we can drive ahead. But just we had to provide training data which followed the, these rules. And with this, uh, the neural networks could learn uh, what they needed to pay attention to. So the whole process, after a while, you get a lot of these rules and a lot of neural networks. And we found it really hard to uh, to do uh, find good training data because otherwise the neural networks get confused because you're all training them at the same time and you can not just simply specify like this neural network needs to pay attention to this because for example when you say you have a rule like um, if there is a red light then you need to slow down but you also have a rule if there is an obstacle then you need to slow down so um, if the car, if you provide the, uh, training data where the car slows down with a red light, 
This also provides evidence for the neural network, which does object detection. It might think like, oh, I need to slow down. So that there is an obstacle, but maybe there is not an obstacle. So that's why we had to spend so long uh, capturing training data. And um, after this training data was captured, we could uh, train the deep problem model itself. And then afterwards, we had to um, modify the program which captured, uh, captures the screen to, instead of just uh, saving the screenshots with the key press, it would just um, uh, query the deep problem model and it would give a key press back, which our program would then be used to press this key in game. So this was the whole loop of how it worked. Uh, when you created the training data, did you have to go back and, and label it for scenes that had a street light and stuff like that? Uh, not really. The only labeling that happened was with the key presses that we were currently pressing. Mm -hmm. So, and then the, yeah, the neural network basically learns what it needs. For example, that it has to detect the red light when we slow down. And so it infers all of that from the rules and the key presses. So if I understand right, you specified the rules and the post conditions were key presses. Then through yeah. the training process, by looking at what keys you pressed, it then would kind of infer what was in the body of that rule based on what the convolutional layers identified in the screenshot. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's quite interesting. I could see how that could raise difficulties, though. Um, do you think any of your training had any kind of noise in it, or did you have to be super vigilant to make sure it was 100% perfect? Yeah, we we can be sure that there was no noise, but we, yeah, when when we were when we noticed that we were driving according to wrong rules, we simply delete the training data. So we had to be really um, precise in this, otherwise the networks would get confused, which in my opinion was one of the hard parts of this project. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. So, um, you know, in your view, kind of what would make this easier? Like if, if you were to go you know, to the creators of Deep Problog or other people watching this video who are in academia and, and working on this stuff. You know, from a from your perspective as a guy who used it, what what do you think should be uh, done to improve this and make it more useful? Um, at first, I think uh, more documentation needs to be developed because the way we learned to program with it was just looking at the source code of the interpreter. So it was at first really hard to know how we needed to write in this. But also, I think it would be way easier if we could just train all the neural networks separately and do it on a labeled data set, for example, one neural network to detect the traffic lights, another to do the lane detection, but to train them all separately and instead of just training them all at the same time and also that they don't need to infer the, what they need to pay attention to based on the key presses, but they, we can just provide a, a traffic light directly. So that would make it a whole lot easier, I think. But for the rest, I thought it was after a while, if you got used to it, it got pretty intuitive, but also I think I don't know how you would do this, but the, uh, the debugging of the project was also really hard because you introduce neural networks. So if the car makes a mistake, we weren't sure if something was wrong with the rules we specified or if the neural network was doing something wrong. So to, and it was also really hard to debug. So what we did was just develop a, a couple of different uh, programs and then just Run them and run them and see which one performed the best driving in game because it was really hard to debug otherwise. Oh, that's really 
That's really interesting. I could see that why that would be a big problem because you've got kind of two tasks, right? You got with the the neural network and you're thinking of all kind of the machine learning stuff. And then on the logic side, you're essentially programming. And so you could, of course, screw something up there. Um, I think what, you know, one thing that is a research topic, I think you inadvertently touched on throughout all of this, though, is something called symbol grounding, which is in logic, there is a lot of discussion in the community as to how symbols in the logic are defined based on the neural network. And, you know, right now, I think this is still an area that uh, there needs to be a lot of work and, and mainly for reasons that you said, because you were in a scenario where you had to make sure that your training data was adhering by rules that you already knew, where ideally, I think you'd want to have the rules specified, but still be able to have a bunch of noise in your training data and say, and just maybe somehow in your loss function, accept the fact that the guy might break the rule. Um, I think your point about debugging is is really um, important too. I mean, when uh, when I was running my startup company, we ran into these kind of issues. Um, not that we were doing neural symbolic, but we found that you know our um, machine learning model that was used to provide predictions to our customers. We would sometimes on days we had bad predictions. Sometimes it would be caused by bad data. Sometimes it would be caused by an implementation error. And then sometimes it would be caused by something with the model or the distribution of data. But these were all like very separate things. Um, and it was really tough uh, to disambiguate. Kind of along these lines, um, you know, what are you what are you looking to do next? Are you, you know, I noticed you had a new video out about chat GPT. Um, and, uh, but, I was also kind of curious if you had any um, further ideas to take, you know, neural symbolic further in, in maybe different applications or maybe explore, you know, autonomy in this, you know, kind of video game environment more. What, what's kind of next? Um, like the thing I'm currently developing is also the thing I'm developing for my master thesis. And it's basically like a, psychologist chatbot that I want people to follow cognitive therapy by chatting to a chatbot. And I'm currently developing that. And I'm also now that the ChatGPT API has been released. I also will try to integrate ChatGPT in it because it will allow me to write way more fluent conversation. And yeah, that's basically what I'm doing at the moment. And, um, and for my master thesis, I'm also researching the effect that personalization of a chatbot can have. Like, for example, uh, if providing an avatar or other um, personalization options gives a better bond with the psychologist chatbot. And yeah, that's what I'm currently doing. Oh, that's, that's pretty interesting. So in doing that, um... I'm kind of curious is, you know, you're, you're essentially setting up different contexts for the chat bot, you know, by, by doing this, um, you know, how are you, um, you know, as you do that, how do you classify different contexts? Because it's, if you're just communicating with the chat bot, you can say different things to it that maybe communicate the same context. You could, you know, so if you want to give the chatbot an idea of the age and, and where you are in, in the world, um, you can say that in a bunch of different ways. You can say, you know, I, I'm an adult. You can t say what, you know, my age range is, you know, 30 to 55. Um, and same thing with geography. And I think, you know, getting into talking about psychological concepts, there's probably a lot of other stuff like that. So how are you looking to kind of nail down these contextual factors a little more? Um, I'm using Raza open source to develop the chatbot. And it provides with 
uh, machine learning methods to detect the intent from your sentence you say to the chatbot. So you can specify a lot of uh, different ways. You could say a specific thing like 10 different, you give them examples of lines of how users say that they are in a certain location. And it will basically learn then that this means the intent of giving the location. So it uses machine learning to generalize different ways people say something. And then based on the intent that's detected in the input, I let the chatbot give a response. So that's how I plan to do this. And I also think it's interesting that by combining this detection of intents in the inputs, you could then invoke chat GPT on a much more um, in a much more precise way because I've for example noticed that chat GPT isn't very good at doing mathematics so you could for example detect that the user is uh, asking something to calculate with an intent and then instead of chat GPT maybe call a calculator or something so with this intent detection you can bring more structure to chat gpt so that's so i'm planning to handle that okay so that intent detection that's part of this what was the name of that open source toolkit uh haza r a s a if you could send me a link i can put yeah. it in the video for people watching yeah. this um that's pretty interesting um yeah we did a little bit of work on chat gpt in my group where we actually were looking at the math problem issue. And um, from a little bit different angle, what we were considered considering was, are there aspects of the math problem that make it more easy or difficult? And we found that, you know, one of the things was you had more um, addition or subtraction operations in the math problem that got uh, progressively tougher uh, to answer. Um, maybe this has something to do with multi-step inference or something like that. I don't know. Um, but anyhow, uh, no, that's really cool. You know, so maybe kind of taking another uh, little bit different direction. You know, so we talk about things that, that you're looking at. Um, you know, you've you know, you've released a couple of YouTube videos that are pretty interesting and, and fun to watch. Um, is, you know, what got you into that? And, you know, is this something you're looking to continue to do? Uh, you know, what was what was your thinking with kicking off a channel? And, you know, you, I've seen you got, at least on the first one, you had over a thousand views, which was, I think, pretty good for, you know, something new. Yeah. Um, like... I previously had a, a gaming YouTube channel and that's reached like uh, 100,000 subscribers. But that was like uh, maybe seven years ago when I wasn't studying at university. So I basically was always all interested in making videos. So now that I'm a master of computer science, I thought uh, it would also be interesting to make videos about computer science topics. And also because that when... I hope to build an audience with it so that if I release like, for example, this uh, psychologist, uh, psychologist uh, chatbot that I already have, I can share it with my viewers and that I can already have some users to try out my things I develop and also to provide an explanation of how things in uh, artificial intelligence work. So basically multiple things like being able to promote my own uh, projects a bit and also explaining how some topics work. Oh, I think that's really quite cool. Um, so, you know, as things, you know, as, as all of us do work in this field, um, there's a lot of people who are thinking about things like artificial general intelligence and, you know, and there's also now, nowadays, there's a lot of debate, um, as you, um, as you showed in your your video, the you know repeated assertions of Elon Musk saying self driving vehicles are a year away. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on kind of uh, you know the future of AI? 
is artificial general intelligence something that is going to be achievable? Um, are we instead going to hit some kind of plateau? And as, as you've shown some interest in, you know, autonomous driving, uh, you know, what do you think the key challenges are with that? Why haven't we reached it uh, yet, despite all these proclamations? Yeah, I think like, first of all, that everyone has like a different definition of AGI. So when multiple people talk about it, I find it hard to like, no, if I believe them that AGI, their specific version of AGI will be achievable. Uh, for example, there are still many things in, that we have no clue about that we humans of like, in my opinion, AGI is being able to build human level intelligence. But I think that would also be incorporating some form of consciousness or emotions. And I don't think we have the slightest clue about how we could implement that. And for the autonomous vehicle part, I also find it very hard to, I don't know if which person to believe when I search for how long is it going to take for this to come out, because Elon is always saying that it's coming out next years and other people are saying it's going to take at least 40 years. And I maybe we have to solve AGI before we can make self-driving cars. But I also thought we might have needed some more advanced AI to do the stuff that ChatGPT is doing. So clearly, I don't really know when it's going to come out. It could come out in five years or 20 years. It wouldn't surprise me either way. No, I think, I think that's... Um... You know, that's all, always the issue of predicting the future. It's just notoriously difficult. And a lot of times things happen in sort of nonlinear ways where, uh, you know, I mean, we saw with the evolution of deep learning uh, with the results on CNN back in 2012 and then the Transformer in 2016. And now, you know, companies adopting it to create large language models. I mean, these were all, sort of, you know, a series of cascading developments that I think if you talk to people, uh, say, when I was in grad school in, you know, 2009, 2010, I don't think anyone would have really thought, hey, there would be advances in neural networks of all things that would lead to what we have today. Um, so, you know, so I think I think you have a good point there. I think it's, it's going to be... Um, really tough to figure out and i think there's certain things you know like chatbots that we've had a lot of advances and i think there's other things uh in ai and ml that um you know things like knowledge graph completion that are you know we have not had uh, the kind of advances one would have expected so um so anyway uh I think, uh, you know, want to thank you again for taking the time uh, to chat with me today. Any thoughts or any recommendations to people, you know, who are looking to consider uh, studying in at the university and looking into these topics of AI as we close off? Um, I think the advice I can give is that you don't really need to go to university to maybe study this. But like, there's a lot of information available online so if you're interested in something like making a chatbot just search on youtube or search on the internet and you will find resources with which you can make what you want to make i would certainly agree i think you know it's astounding to me to see the amount of resources and stuff that's available nowadays I know when I was a kid, if you wanted to program in a sophisticated programming language, that really meant you'd have to make a major investment or you'd have to, you know, be doing it out of the, you know, university. Um, and nowadays, everything is so democratized. It's, it's just really amazing. So thanks again for the chat and, uh, you know, to the audience. Uh, thank you for tuning in and please like and subscribe.